Wondering how you can achieve the best results from your parent-teacher conference? Find out next. Education Today starts now. Hello and welcome to Education Today. I'm Jonathan Zisch with the Armstrong School District. Friday, October 14, 2005 is this year's parent-teacher conference date in the Armstrong School District. How can you, the parent, get the most out of your 15-20 minutes with your child's teacher? To answer your questions, we have two school principals with us today. First, we have Mrs. Sue Kreidler, principal at West Hills Elementary School. Next, we have Mr. Tom Dinga, principal at Lenape Elementary School. On behalf of the administration and school board, welcome to Education Today. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for being here. Sure. First, please tell us a little bit about yourselves and your experience with parent-teacher conferences. Thank you for asking, John. My experience as a parent, I think, has helped me prepare as an educator for parent-teacher conferences. And that's the first time I ever stepped into that conferencing role uh, as a mom, hmm. approaching the school and the elementary school, that important kindergarten time. Uh, the other roles I've played at parent-teacher conference, I've been a teacher, instructional support teacher. I've also sat in on parent-teacher conferences as a reading specialist, a reading supervisor, assistant principal, and a principal. Hmm. So I've had an opportunity to be a part of those conferences from different perspectives. See it from all angles. Yes. Mr. Denger, how about you? Well, John, once again, thanks for inviting us. My um, pleasure. It's, as Sue, I've been a lot of, uh, a lot of different wearing a lot of different hats in the meetings uh, over the years and started uh, as Sue as a parent. I still actually had, uh, had a parent-teacher conference last week with uh, one, of, uh, one of my son's teachers, so we're still part of that. And it, it feels kind of strange sometimes to be on the other side of it because you have the principal side and then also the, uh, the parent side. But uh, through being a principal and dean of students and ESS support teacher years back and uh, worked at four different grade levels, uh, so you get a little bit of a, a different perspective uh, as you go through your years of experience in, uh, in the school. Well, that's great. Well, I, I'd like to start by uh, throwing out a general question. What is the goal of parent-teacher conference? What is the purpose of it? Uh, you know, whoever would like to take that question. Well, the purpose or the goal of a parent-teacher conference is to develop a relationship with that teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. The relationship is critical in a, stu in a student's academic progress and you want to get to know that teacher and get to know what the expectations are for your child in that classroom and for that year. Hmm. Anything to add to that? Yeah, Mr. it's I'll just piggyback on to Sue here. Uh, it's a critical step. Uh, hopefully, it's the next step, and there have been communications to that point. Each uh, situation could be different uh, with teachers and parents. Maybe they haven't had a chance to, to chat yet, but hopefully, either through email or written communication, they've already communicated and this would be the next step. Regardless if it's the first, second, or tenth time they've met, it's, uh, it, it, it's vital. Sure. It, it, has, it has to Build take place. And, and it, I think another thing sometimes we forget about when the, when the child knows that there's communication between the teacher and the parent, uh, things that get, seem to get done and success seems to be a little faster. Mm -hmm. So it's also a big part of it. That's true. Um, you know, following up on that, what, what are, you know, just very brief, briefly, what, what's the outline of the parent-teacher conference? What are the basic, you know, topics that come up? Uh, I'd say in a, in a 15 to 20 minute period, as, as we talked beforehand, um, it, it's really that social component, academic component, or behavioral component. And once again, there may have been some communication before that conference, but it's really a review of those things. I know as a parent, when I go in, uh, I'm thinking about if my son is, uh, is he happy at school? Hmm. Does he have friends? What's he do at recess? Is he off by himself or does he, does he mingle? Does he play with others? And then how are those uh, play habits? Are they positive? Are there some things in there that I need to know about? And then certainly move into the academics and, and try to go uh, subject by subject on what the teacher feels might be strengths or weaknesses okay. within the subject. 
So the teacher might cover academics, social, and mm -hmm. behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about, you know, how can parents prepare for the parent-teacher conference? Well, that's a critical part of the conference. Just like a teacher prepares for that conference, they put a lot of time and thought in preparing to meet with those parents. And as parents, to get the most out of that short period of time, you do have to do your homework. I brought with, the, with me today two important components that the district provides for parents at the beginning of the year. The first one being the elementary handbook. Parents should be familiar with this. Go through it. If there are any questions about anything in the handbook, you know, put a little post-it note so you make sure that you ask that question from the appropriate person. The other piece that we brought with us is the curriculum highlights. This is distributed to all children, kindergarten through sixth grade, and it gives the parents uh, a compact way of looking at the curriculum, and in it are tips to help their children. And again, any questions about anything, take those booklets with you, read through them, and prepare. Another important part of it is to talk to the children. Ask the children, who are you playing with? What's going on in your classroom? What kinds of things are you learning? Are you having difficulty for any, with anything? Uh, what do you enjoy? And write all of this down in a little notebook or, uh, that you may have. Write down a lot of questions you might have, perhaps about samples of work. Take the samples of work. You might be questioning, you know, how are children, you know, expected to add numbers? But write those down for, for you. And also notes about your family, about your child. Uh, what does your child like to do? Are there any of those little things uh, about your child that you should share with that teacher? Those are important parts uh, to take so that teacher can look at your child as a whole person. I, I would say, John, that that's funny that Sue should bring it up because we've had a couple this week at school where, and it, this has happened over the years, that there are triggers for kids that sometimes uh, there just hasn't been a communication or the parent doesn't feel it's important enough to maybe let staff know, but it, it could be as simple as, not simple because it's certainly serious, but it, when a dog dies or there's something happening in a home, sure. parent goes back to work or maybe goes to work for the first time and it changes the, uh, the transitions of morning and afternoon and coming home and leaving. For some kids, n no issues. For other kids, big issues. And sometimes those will come out at school and, and the teacher may say or think, well, you know, has anything changed? Has anything happened? So if there's anything like that, as Sue mentioned, like in, in, the, in the child's life or extended situation, let them know because it, it may come out at school. Well, you know, uh, when the parent is sitting there in front of the teacher, what are some of the good things that they could hear from the teacher? And also, what are some of maybe the unpleasant things they might hear from the teacher? Mm. Well, the good things are that their child's doing very well uh. academically, socially, and behaviorally. Um, I think all parents, when we send our children to school, we want them to be the best that they can be, and we hope that they're being good at school. Uh, some of the surprises could be, uh, it could be something like the child is very talkative, and maybe your child ordinarily is a very quiet, respectful child, but they get in the environment with their peers and their talkativeness. Some parents are surprised by that. Uh, another example may be behaviorally. Some children, perhaps their circle friends are limited at home or in their neighborhood, and when they get with a lot of children on a playground, sometimes they're not stopping to think of what the consequence of their behavior is going to be. So parents sometimes are surprised by those aspects of the conference. Like they might get told their child's aggressive? Yes. And that's yes. Could take, if, you, yeah. if you're a parent hearing that for the first time, you could easily be taken aback. Exactly, exactly. And it may be as simple as on, uh, at the primary level, um, a first grader, kindergarten student might want to be first in line all the time or might want to be the first one to kick in the kickball game. It may not be, it may be something just with that communication that the parent can go home and, and, and really talk with their, their son or daughter. At, at the primary level, sometimes those things are major issues with, sure. with some students. And if the, if the teacher tells a parent that their child is, seems somewhat shy or not as social, I mean, mm -hmm. that could be a surprise too. And it's, I, I you always would, have to keep your composure as a parent mm, sitting absolutely. there hearing that for the first time. I would say most of the comments that either as a parent or a teacher that I've been involved in, most of the time the parent will say, yeah, I see that at home too. Yeah. Whether it's an aggression or there's a, or organizational issues, 
what's, what's maybe soon to be in Messier not being able to, to, to organize his work. Usually there's a, yeah, we see that too. And, and then that's where it could be a really stepping stone to discuss, well, here's some tips with the teacher's experience. Here's some things that might support those areas. But every once in a while, there's, there's a surprise that comes in. Yeah. Sure. Now, just taking this uh, image a little further, we have the parents there and the teacher for the first time, probably, in an in, in-depth conversation. What is it like from the teacher's point of view? What are they there for? What are they thinking and feeling as this is going on? What's their role, in other words? I'd say to be positive and supportive as much as possible. The goal, obviously, seems pretty simple to say is, we're at that table to, to get the most uh, possible out of your student in, in all those areas that we've mentioned to see growth, prepare them for, for future endeavors in school. So whatever is um, discussed there is certainly important. So the teacher comes in uh, hopefully leading with positives and telling the, the parent the positives that they see and the good points uh, about their child. And there may be some issues, there may not be any issues. I mean, there's a lot of students that just are so well-rounded that a lot of times teachers, I don't know what to tell you, he's the perfect guy, but if there are some issues, the teacher's only bringing those up because we want to solve them to, to improve on those so that the student has success in school. So but the teacher's not picking on them or anything? No. The it, purpose it, of it is, what is the purpose it, of them bringing it? I would say to solve the problem because whether it is a, um, a behavioral issue or, or certainly an academic issue, and, unless we can solve or find out answers for it, it's, it's going to compound itself. Okay. down the road, yes. Very good. I think another role I remember back as a classroom teacher, I wanted to know what that child was like at home mm -hmm. in a different environment because that brings um, a clear understanding for perhaps how a child reacts the way they do in class or perhaps some of their work habits, uh, how they structure their day as far as when they're given independent time. So I think as a teacher you want to be able to look at that child as a whole child uh, looking at, a, at him from all different aspects. Hmm. Very nice. We're going to take a short break from education today on the Armstrong School District. When we come back, we're going to look at what questions parents can ask at the parent-teacher conference. Um, we're back. Ask. So uh, before we took our break from education today, we were going to talk about questions that parents can ask of their teacher at the parent-teacher conference. And uh, which of you, would, would you like to take this first, Mrs. Kreiber? I'll begin. Okay. I think uh, I'm going to wear parent shoes on this oh, one. Oh, feel free. Okay. Um, I think the most important question I had was, how does my son get along with other children in the class? That came primarily from the fact that he didn't have a lot of other children to play with, and I was concerned about his social skills. Mm. And of course, the second question is, how is my child doing academically? Uh, what subjects is he doing well in, and which ones can I help him? You know, and those were my two primary questions as a parent. Because, and, and as Sue mentioned earlier about preparing for the conference itself, as teachers are sending papers home, and you're seeing papers, there might have been a particular paper a week ago where something stood out. Let's say within that paper that a child had trouble regrouping on three or four problems and missed those. Mm. That, with that preparation and then paying attention to works coming home, that would be one of my questions. So he's having some issues. Have you seen improvement on it? And what are some things that you might be working on? What are some things I can do at home? Because I see that that, that looked like a weakness on that particular paper. It sounds like as the worksheets are coming home almost from day one, mm -hmm. a parent could theoretically mm -hmm. begin preparing for the parent-teacher conference and just keeping a little paper off the side, right. making notes. And a lot of times parents certainly won't wait. They may call the next day or they may email the teacher or they may communicate in some way. So once again, as I said at the beginning, uh, each situation is different. This might be the the 20th time that they've talked or communicated or it might be the second. So, mm -hmm. but, but those are some things you can bring to the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. And another thought, Jonathan, if this is a first child for a parent, I think one of the primary questions that they need to ask a teacher is, is my child reaching his or her potential? That's Are they one. working 
to the extent of their abilities because some children uh, need a little coaxing or a little special attention to reach that potential. So I think that's important for a first parent. Sure. You know. And at the end of the show, we'll flash up a graphic of all other questions that uh, parents can write down and ask at their parent-teacher conferences. Um, mm -hmm. When that conference is over, I'm just trying to think in my mind, mm -hmm. the parents going home with their child, uh, or maybe going home and their child is there, the mom or dad, and uh, how should the parent follow up at home, and how should the parent not follow up at home immediately after that conference? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing a parent needs to relate to the child positive things that happen out of that conference, talk about the child's strengths and the things that the child is doing very well. Uh, to themselves and maybe with their spouse, you know, talk about the consi uh, any suggestions, any ideas, and make sure that they leave that conference with somewhat of a plan if the child is having difficulties and be prepared to discuss it and follow through with it. Uh, that's on the positive side, but if the child is having difficulties, uh, you know, stop and think about it. If the child has been a behavior problem, you're not going to want to address that right away with the child. You need to have time to reflect on it and maybe get more information. Also, from the child's perspective, why is it important for him to hear the positive, him or her to hear the positive things first? And what, uh, you know, could that be bad for them if they hear? You know, I just got back from your conference and this, you're doing this, this, and this. Uh, it's a deficiency, you know. Is, is that bad for them? And well, whether you're a child or an adult, I, I think all three of us sitting here um, at, at times lack confidence, even though it may not seem like that. So I, I think we all want to feel good about ourselves and, and feel confident that you know, people will see those positives and that I'm doing well in some things. So I, I think that's a, a natural to really build up before you if you have any corrections or any things you want to talk about, and it might be as simple as organizational skills. It could be the teacher may, you, you asked about follow-up, the teacher might say, well, we're working on fluency. Fluency is not a major issue, but we'd like to see uh, what, where we can go from here. So they might suggest a, a 10 minutes of reading a night or something along those lines, or it may be organizational skills. Uh, why don't you try a folder? And on this side of the folder, you know, put math papers on this side of the folder, whatever it may be. That follow-up then would be week, week and a half, two weeks later, the, the parent calling saying, well, this is how it's working, or this is what I'm seeing, hmm. and, and, and build off of that, whether it's, it's working or it's not working, and go from there. So that, that follow-up, it, it certainly depends. Each individual conference is going to be different, but the follow-up is, is certainly critical as well. How could a parent follow up, say they were told by their teacher that uh, their child is a little bit aggressive, maybe even bullies others. How could a parent effectively follow up after that? What's a good plan for that? Well, that, that is an individual, as, as we know, uh, each parent brings their child up or talks to their children in, in different ways and then sets different values on them. Um, if a child is used to, uh, we, we get this comment a lot, while they, they were at preschool or at their wherever they may have been at a sitter, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do, and now they're coming into a structured situation. So that may, in some cases, might not even be the child's fault. It's just that that's, that's right. what he's used no to. There's no toys in first grade, <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> not even in kindergarten anymore. Oh, wow. <laughs> so um, d depending what the, the folks would be, you'd sit down and say, this is what I'm hearing. Can you tell me a little bit about the playground? Or can you tell me a little bit about the cafeteria? Or can you tell me a little bit about the bus? who you're with, what's happening, and, and let your child explain to you, in their words, what they see. And sometimes within that discussion, something may come up or a problem. They may bring up what the problem is, and you can go from there. And it may be the same problem the teacher mentioned, or if it isn't, then there's more communication that's needed. And I'd like to follow up on something you said. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you phrased that, the, the parent speaking to their child, the parent did not say, you know, I, your teacher said you had a deficiency in aggression mm -hmm. in the playground. Mm -hmm. How did you word it? The parents should say it. I, I would say on the play, when we go to the playground, like we take our, if our kids when they were younger, a little bit older, we don't go to the playground anymore, but we talked about different rules on the playground and, and the way we're going to behave. Um, when you play at school, what are some of the things, do kids follow those rules? Do you follow those rules? What's it look like? Uh, can you tell me about the playground and, and kind of let them in their own words tell you and from their eyes, what it 
what they see uh, they see as maybe some issues. Mm. Keep it open ended. Right. Sometimes right. direct questions will make a child very defensive. They think they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And therefore, some children will, in their brain, go back and forth, do I make up a story or do I tell the truth? And in casual conversation, encourage them to express it, like Tom said, in their own words, will give you more information as a parent or as a teacher. Mm. And, and I would say, as Sue and I have talked many times, if we get a student in our office, off the conferencing a little bit, but the same tact would be if there was a cafeteria issue or a bus issue or a playground issue, or whatever it may be, when, they, when the student would come in, we would say, oh, tell me a little bit how the playground's going. We're not going to say, you know, I heard you were doing such and such on a, what you, and, and so you're going to say, L tell me about the playground. What's mm -hmm. up on the bus? Any issues with people or center? And, and sometimes kids would be very, for the most part, they're very forthright and mm -hmm. they're going to let you know. You know, I, I did this or I said this today, I shouldn't have done that, you know, I apologize. And, and, and so I, I just think it's a better way to attack it. Sure. Question for you, Mrs. Kreidler. Uh, what are some of the worst things a parent can do, either at or after a parent-teacher conference? After, afterwards, go home and yell at your child. <laughs> yeah. um, I think after a parent conference that you need to be careful how you approach your child if it's something negative. Some of the things we've already been talking about. I think also if you've had a conflict, um, maybe hearing things at that conference that you were not happy with, is stopping and reflecting. I think that's a good thing to do. But the worst things are over to overreact. The parent overreacts. Yes. Okay. Um, any follow up on that? I, I would just say <coughs> once again to turn it to a pause and comes when you get to that part that's the issue, say, look, this is what teachers are telling me, this is what staff's saying. We're gonna we're gonna fix this. We're gonna work on it. Let's sit down, let's talk about it and we're gonna we're gonna plan. We're gonna we're gonna make this a situation that's going to improve, and I think really, from from that vein, make it a goal, almost a game that we're going to we're going to correct it. Sure. Now, sometimes, as we talk about the improvements of mm -hmm. these areas, parents will hesitate to call the teacher, or they'll hesitate to write that email. But uh, as I'm learning, the teachers actually want that type of participation, mm -hmm. and I wondered if you would just uh, elaborate on that. We get a lot of I get a lot of calls, very polite calls, and say, "Well, they start out with, I hate to bother you.'" Which you. isn't, but that, you know, that's my job. That's that's Sue's job. We're there, we're the conduit, I guess, between mm -hmm. certainly between home and, and the teacher at times. That's what we're there for. Sometimes uh, I get more of my information from parents to fix things that uh, I would have never known otherwise. So mm -hmm. we, we, and just like we do, teachers do as well. So when a parent communicates with a teacher about anything academic or behavioral, things get fixed. If they don't get fixed at least we, we get a plan on how to eventually fix them. Our issues and teachers' issues are when there isn't a communication, when we can't get that communication going or we don't see somebody at parent-teacher conference, it's, it's harder to fix the problem because you, you need it on both ends. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, phone calls and emails are welcome, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. gathering. Absolutely. And uh, when you go to the parent-teacher conference, should, you, should the parent automatically come back with some information about how to contact the teacher? And if so, what? Oh, they should, in fact, chances are at the beginning of the year, the teacher's already sent a letter telling the parent exactly how to contact them, giving them information as far as phone numbers, email address. They'll also give them information as far as when their free time is at school. So if a parent's at work and it's during a prep time, they would be able to contact that person. So that's usually done early in the year, but if it's not done, the, it's done at that point or it's also uh, reiterated at that time. Okay. You know, stressing the importance of that communication. Excellent. Well, uh, that's our show for today. I'd like to thank both of you for being yeah. here. Yeah. John, could I add one thing? Real I was quick, just thinking. Sure. The, uh, the highlights book, if the parents have not received one, uh, if they didn't go to back to school night and didn't receive one, please call the school, let the teacher know if one hasn't come home yet so they can have this very important piece to have. That is key. Yeah. Mrs. Cradley, thank you also for being thank you for on asking the show. Me. Okay. I'd also like to thank some of our central office administrators who gave expert advice on the creation of this show. They include Dr. Cheryl Soloski and Dr. Bev Long. Please join us again next week for another look at the Armstrong School District. You won't want to miss it. We'll talk to four marching band students about their experiences in high school band. For more information about what's going on in the district, please visit our website.
Take care, and we'll see you next week. I'm Melissa Brocchetti from Catanning Senior High School, and this is what's happening around the Armstrong School District. A national effort to get the Americans singing the national anthem again found its way to Catanning Township and Elderton Elementary Schools. Music teachers at both schools taught their student bands and chorus the music to the Star Spangled Banner in time for the annual Back to School Night. On Back to School Night, parents, kids, and teachers reported to the gym to sing the anthem. Sounds simple, right? But this twist on back to school night was important because two of three American adults don't know all the words to the national anthem. According to a recent Harris poll, the Music Educators National Conference, a professional organization, led nationwide effort in September to spotlight the importance of role music education plays in giving Americans a patriotic voice. The organization's National Anthem Project was designed to reacquaint Americans with this unifying part of our heritage. Armstrong School District teachers Alice Young and Elaine Kerr are members of the national organization and led the effort at the Catanning Township and Elderton Elementary Schools. Soon, the school district also expects to be educating three Mississippi students whose family evacuated their Gulfport area house to escape the hurricane damage, the students plan to live with local relatives and will likely finish school, the school year at Armstrong School District. After news reports of the hurricane damage came in, students and teachers began suggesting fundraisers to help the hurricane survivors. Students, parents, and teachers are at work coming up with inventive ideas for fundraisers. Updates will be shared in coming weeks. The district plans to give the money to the American Red Cross. Armstrong County Chapter, which will be forward collections to the Hurricane Katrina relief efforts, the district hopes to give the money to the Red Cross just after October 31st. Although additional fundraising may continue after that. At schools across the districts, parents and the public can donate by cash or check to help the Armstrong School District relief effort. Individual checks from the public should be made payable to the high school of the donor's choice. Even if the check writer is most familiar with the elementary school, because the district is using service club activity accounts at each high school for money collection. In the memo line of individual checks, people can write Hurricane Katrina Relief Fund Foundation. That's all for now. I'm Melissa Brocchetti from Katianning Senior High School. Keep watching.